The charismatic and fascinating Jarbo first burst onto the music scene as a core of the primetime swans. She matched the intensity of key member Michael Gyra with her own creativity, her keyboard parts and her vocals and a sense of artfulness easily matched the terrifying figure of Gyra. These days, post-swans, she's released a series of fascinating projects and collaborations with various musicians from all over the world. I caught up with her in Atlanta and the conversation started and she talked about where she lives now. Well, and so it's like this small community, which is in between two larger communities. And I like it because um, it is part of the river. So, you know, the river is right close and there's lots of parks and it's just a very natural kind of environment. And it does not have the urban vibe that Atlanta has. It doesn't have that at all. It's, it's, a, it's a very eclectic community. I, I like it a lot. I moved from my home in Atlanta that I, that I had, and I'm so much happier here. Yeah, because were, were you born in Atlanta? I know you grew up in New Orleans. Um... No, I was born in a rural community in Mississippi. And then um, my relatives were in New Orleans. And so uh, we traveled a lot back and forth between the two places. My father was on undercover. So with that, and on assignment, he was from Chicago. So we, we, uh, we were in Mississippi because he was on an assignment. And that's how I was born there. But I don't have any, I don't technically have any Southern roots whatsoever because New Orleans is not the South. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. so I don't, I don't <laughs> technically have any, any Southern uh, connection. Just happened well, to be educated, born and educated here because of my parents' work. Well, um, I, I think it's been an interview somewhere where you said you're quite proud of your Southern roots and... You felt that was important. Well, the, part. the south, the south, the south is what informed me, and it's what gave me the creative uh, uh, stimulus because I was surrounded by so many different elements that were stimulating: voodoo, the Mardi Gras, the the the, the dancing on the streets, Enola, and the just the very eclectic community. The mixture of cultures, specifically in 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 uh, Enola, was was important to me. Is that, that's more New Orleans. Than yeah, I mean, you, you can't but help when you're a kid and you, and, and you have so many street performers and dancing and music everywhere. Uh, and then you go to the Mardi Gras parade and, and you see all the rituals and the, you know, it, and I have relatives that are buried there. And, and Well, not buried, they're above the ground in mausoleums. And so it's a very creative and inspiring place. Now it's changed, it's been through a lot. But when I was a kid, you know, it was, it was a, a place of magic for me. So, so it, I've been there a few times and you can still feel a voodoo about it, mm -hmm. but it's also quite touristy as well. So mm -hmm. bef was there a time before that when, when um, it was a very different city? Yeah, well, I would avoid Bourbon Street, you know, and if you avoid Bourbon Street, then you're away from the places that are designated tourist spots, you know, but there are other, there are other places there still. I, well, I played there with Father Murphy, and it was so much the same. It was a very powerful moment to go back there, and we, we had a great time there. I mean, I could have stayed there a week. It was so much fun. You say that's informed you uh, when mm -hmm. you're growing up. So was mm -hmm. it like there was a, a world beyond just the normal world is that what you got from it or or did you just get you fascinated into magic and, and voodoo and well i think i think the combination of the roman catholic mass uh, uh because i was raised in that in the, the, the catholic church i think the combination of that with the you know the kind of santeria elements and the the black magic elements and, and and i think i was surrounded by multicultural influences so I didn't understand, as I got older, I didn't understand things like, um, I don't know, racism or the difference between, you know, cultures, I, because I grew up immersed in that culture. And the woman that really kind of raised me a lot as a child was this wonderful, um, you know, African-American woman who could sing, sing all these wonderful songs to me. And she taught me so much, you know, she'd tell me these stories. So I think that I 
kind of feel like I, you know, have a multicultural influence. And that, and I, I look at that now as being very important to songwriting and performing and, and creativity. Would it be true to say New Orleans, all the different cultures uh, mix up a lot more than other American cities? Because when I go to other American cities, you, you have like, there's an Italian area, a Polish area, a black area, which I mean, now most cities have that, but America's very... It's very, it seems very split split to me, but when I, time to be in New Orleans, it does feel mm-hmm. like more of a soup or a gumbo in a sense. Yes, it is. It <laughs> is, and it's uh, and it's a quite uh, has it definitely has more of a European vibe to it as well. This is why I say it's not part of the South. It's its own. It's its own place. Like New York City is its own. Manhattan is its own place. You know, it's like it's a country within a country, basically. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's incredibly European, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the nearest thing we have here would be Savannah. Savannah has that same kind of vibe, very uh, full of artists, very creative, and and a lot of the same iron work, the metal work, and the small houses, and and it has the same kind of vibe. I think you know, I think a lot of things are built at the same time. So your par- both your parents were working for the FBI, weren't they? That's how they met. That's how they met. met. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh, that's how they met. Now that's to somebody in England, that just seems almost like it's out for film or something. It's hard to imagine having parents in the FBI. So, what was that like? What kind of upbringing was that? Well, you don't really know anything uh, other than you don't know exactly what they do, and also um, long periods of time without them because there's a lot of traveling involved. So, I would say a large part of my childhood, I didn't. didn't know where my father was because he would go away for a long long period of time mm-hmm. a very long yeah. period of time so it's like you and then he would come home with surprises you know and gifts like gifts from mexico or gifts from say chinatown and san francisco and just you know and, and it, but he just he traveled all the time um he was in law enforcement his whole life but having said that he had a degree and he had a master's degree in psychology he had a degree in uh, forestry and uh, and my mother was always a career woman, you know, she, she worked. And, and so I grew up with this idea, image of, you know, a strong woman who could kind of do it all, you know, cause she did it all. She, yeah, she had yeah. children, <laughs> she had to work, she, she knew a lot of things, you know, and, and I kind of feel like, um, more or less the black sheep because I, <laughs> I was always <laughs> arty and artistic and, and I just loved drawing and, 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 you know, making things and, my focus was always on an insular world. I created my own world. So I was always a very quiet uh, internal child. And I think that I kind of had to develop that as a, as a skill, as a survival. Is that, is that because you were moving around a lot? Um, maybe because, you know, you can't really make friends when you're changing schools. So that could very well be could be uh, one of those reasons. But I also think you just sort of, some of us, some people are just kind of born where they are happy, you know, creating their own world because they're artistic. They, they, their creativity is their, you know, their world. So I'm, I'm one of those people that's happy to just be alone and just constantly be working on ideas and creating things, you know. So it's just how some of us are, I think. Yeah. In, in a way, uh, a pioneer for the current times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. We did an interview. I think Daniel was 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 part of it. This journalist had uh, asked a group of people she had talked to before to talk about. This is a long time ago, months ago, about the pandemic, and I and I was very blunt and minimalist. I was just like, well, nothing's really changed for me other than my tour was canceled, and yeah. and I've been, I've been touring every single year, and I love to tour. But other than that, you know, everything is the same. I work at home. I work on, by myself. I'm a loner, so it's. You know, that aspect of my life hasn't changed. But what I do miss is, um, you know, is going to cultural events. And because my life is, is I love nothing more than to go see an art gallery opening, a, a, a play, a dance performance. I mean, I, I, I love it. And that's, and I regularly attended those things. And so, so that's, that's been painful to not get out and see other people's, you know, work. It's an interesting dichotomy of creating art in your own your own world, creating your own world, and performing it live. Do, do you see that's 
being too different, or is is there a sort of uh, continuum between the two? Uh, well, I think you know. I think I'm not alone when I say as a performer. You kind of thrive on performance, you know, and you thrive on the live experience. And, and it's sort of like, uh, you know, it's like oxygen in your blood. I mean, it just sort of, and it's really, really been painful, I think, for, for performers, you know, not just people that are composing music or writing at home, I think, in their office. I think that it's, it's been um, difficult to, to not get out there and to, you know, to have, because it's very exhilarating, as you well know, it's very exhilarating to do performances and also to not, you know, to have to be a flexible and have, have the ability to adapt to whatever situation there is, you know, and I've certainly had plenty of experience with that. <laughs> so this last tour, um, you know, it was, it's just kind of heartbreaking because it was a dream tour. And uh, they had booked a, a, an ideal tour for me, the venues I wanted to perform in, they were art venues, they were old churches, they were everything I wanted, and, and I was very, very happy. And we had rehearsed, and we were performing, um, uh, getting ready to present a multimedia show. And, um, you know, the person I was going to tour with had created a film, and so we are going to have this full experience. And then the major thing for me was, uh, you know, playing the keyboard for the first time since the 1997 Swans tour, which is was the final tour for me, and so I was actually going to be, you know, the, playing the keyboard, not just doing vocals. And so it was really, um, let's well, say, not just doing vocals. My vocals are really hard; they're <laughs> exhausting. <laughs> but the thing is, is that um, I'm just going to do both. And I had studied how to do it to where I'd be sometimes playing and then sometimes just singing. And because when I sing, I pretty much, it takes my entire body. I sing from my body. So it's, it's something that's, uh, I can't really do both at the same time because they're both so intense. So, so this was going to be a very different tour and I'm hoping we can still do it, but who knows when that's going to be? Who the hell knows when that's going to yeah. be? <laughs> About a year, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it's that that's the, that's the, the thing about it, you know, is that it, you have this sense of of mourning, you know, mm. because you're 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 missing a, a lifestyle. Mm. You talk about your voice, there, and I've always found your voice incredibly fascinating because you do so many different voices, and you use your voice in a very different way. You don't use your voice like a straight vocalist. It's almost like no. you're paint, painting a picture with sounds or I don't even know mm -hmm. how to describe it, but e even within one song, it'd be four or five different voices. Mm -hmm. are, are, they, are they meant to be all like, uh, sort of diverse personas or just aspects yeah, of your own persona? Yeah, it's, it's, never, it's never fake or, or preconceived or, or artificial for me. It's natural for me in that I, I kind of go within and, and I, um, I, I have a story, a, a play, a narrative in my in my head you know in, in my entire being and i try to um you know i try to express that and so the voices that i use would be coming from that narrative and so you become different different personas you, know, you become different energy so in a way it's almost um you know like an actress who is you know becoming someone else and and um, that's how I kind of look at it is that you you kind of go within and then you become that. And this on illusory and on the new thing, which I haven't released publicly yet, which was conceived and pretty much part of the illusory album. Um, that's where I started exploring um, the voice as uh, just using uh, syllables, consonants, and vowels, but not in a pretty way, not in a sing-songy way, but in a, but in more of a, a possessed way, so that you have uh, you you have some kind of supernatural force speaking through you, but it's it's not it's it's not it's not scary and it's not it's not uh, but it's not pretty either it's it's just sort of deliberate and that was an interesting experiment and i like this approach and i and i don't know how long i can keep doing it where it's uh going to maintain a freshness but i've done it again on on the the next thing and i'm i'm even happier with the with this version of it because it's just so um 
precise. And so I'm influenced by a lot of different languages that come into it, whether it's Arabic or whether it's, whether it's you know, a Germanic kind of a, a, a accent. There's a certain deliberation to it, but it's not, it's not a language. It's coming from me. So that's, so, that's yeah. probably the most extreme thing I've done in terms of, of uh, utilizing consonants and vowels. So you're fascinated by language, like the rhythm and the melody of language. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, you can, you can take uh, the most, it doesn't matter, you can take some lyrics that, you know, could completely describe something else, but then with your emotions that you, you put across with your voice, you can completely change the narrative. And I did that, of course, any number of times with Michael with draw with his with collaborations with him. Like I would take his a good example would be I crawled, you know, my version of I crawled, where um, I took that narrative of that that song and I divided it up into like five different characters and personas. So it's like you get through all these psychological states. And so it's pretty gut wrenching where you know, you at the end, it was uh, uh, really demonic. Where it was you know, in my mind, I knew what was happening, mm-hmm. and so it was it was uh, pretty harsh. And so you could say <clears throat> you could say it was literal, or you could say the way that I saw it, which was a metaphor for being overtaken, being overtaken by a force. So in that same song, I was like a little girl lost, you know, with a little little sing songy melody, and then. I was kind of, you know, breathy, starting out kind of breathy. So I went through all these different personas. And as that tour progressed, that character, those characters were able to develop more and more and more. And that's what I like. I like to be able to work on, work on that kind of a development in front of an audience. And does the audience actually accentuate it? You know, with the the energy of the audience. Yeah, well, they they can, you know, and that's that's uh, one of the things I really um, did like about um, the wall of sound in that project, but also working with neurosis in that project was the fact that when you have that wall of sound, it's it's a as a vocalist, it's interesting because you feel like you're wearing armor. And it's almost like they're, um, you know, they're knights and they have on metal, you know, and they have swords. I mean, and so you feel, you feel just because you've got that backing of power, <laughs> you feel, um, you feel like you are, you know, you have an army behind you. And so that kind of is a freeing experience. It, it depends on how you use that kind of power. But the people yeah. that, that I've worked with that have that kind of power don't do it in a careless way. They do it in a very contro- have did it in a very controlled way, if you follow what I mean. Yeah, it, it, almost in a sense to build the foundation for the vocalist mm-hmm. to, to go that extra, extra mile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for so sure. All, so all these different voices, would they be, um, would these be almost explorations of your sort of deep in the psyche in a sense you're coming in itself different angles like the little girl voice would that be a version of you as a little girl or is that just acting out the part of a little girl and and will these all be like opening little doors right into you into the subconscious yeah it's not referencing me it's uh it's it's referencing an image or an idea of innocence i'd say when i've used that voice and I got pretty good at it just through practice, through uh, through learning how to not pronounce things, articulate things, to where it sounded like you know a real a real kid, you know. And so, so I think I think I can do that. I, I made an uh, when I first uh, moved to New York. Before I moved to New York, I had made an audition tape cassette in those days, and it had a. Uh, you know, the, basically a, a demo of, of all the different kind of voices. I even had a British accent in there. I mean, I did all these different voices singing and singing to kind of show the range and show what I could do. I even had, I had segments of walls, which is an experimental uh, gallery performance thing that I did. And that's basically before autism where the person is kind of losing it and screaming and, 
going through a lot of, um, you know, emotions. And then at the end, they're just kind of rocking back and forth, repeating the same phrase over and over. So I, I dumped all that up on him. On my <laughs> and I think he kind of got an idea of that. But then, ironically, I wasn't even uh, expressing any of that for a full, for moving up there until, uh, geez, you know, the holy money and the uh you know doing background vocals and then culminating in the skin project so so these vocals weren't really out of the gate in terms of my involvement even though that was the way i had tried to enter you know that that be involved i thought it'd be something different um i think that he he waited you know for me i kind of kind of went through trial by fire i had to prove myself playing in punk clubs skinhead clubs um, was, you know, spit at, uh, kicked, yelled at, a uh, brutal, 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 brutal <laughs> experience. <laughs> the first, uh, the first year or so of touring. Um, and, and now I look back on that, um, as, uh, you know, it, it, it was good because you've seen it all at this point, you know, you've, you've been through so much that, um, you you you're stronger for it. Now I don't know that many many uh, people could go through that, uh, but um, that was what I went through. And yeah, of course, when yeah. I started singing, it was it was just a shocking. I mean, those audiences weren't ready for it, and 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 uh, they were just really putting me through the through the meat grinder. <laughs> and uh, it took a while, you know, for me to establish myself in that group as, as being a singer. And so then as I started to become accepted by the audience, the audience began to change. And women started showing up to the shows, girls and women, and and they uh, that they were welcoming. They were welcoming to the point where it was like I had my own audience in that audience. So mm-hmm. that was but that was a long process. So it's good because it's um it's it helps you as a performer to go through that. It, it does seem like uh, when when I read about it, you know, the, the bunker and your experiences and the whole of that early New York Swans period, it is a very very incredibly intense claustrophobic existence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a nightmare. I look I look back on that and I'm I'm thinking. Wow, that's <laughs> it's incredible, you know. And even now, like I'll have flashes, you know. Like, wow, I lived in a, I lived like we called it the bunker. I lived in the place. It was a cement, uh, like basically the storage part of the building. And um, you know, there were no windows. There was a, a little tiny air vent. We had a piece of wood on it with a piece of two by four over it that you would open up to get the to get some air in in the rehearsal room. And then there was a small cutout, which had an old rickety air conditioning unit in it. And that was it. So it was very secure with a, uh, a metal, very a, a huge metal door with multiple deadbolt locks and then a police lock on the inside. So police lock is where you pull it out and bolts go. Shoop. So that would be <laughs> on the inside. And then the outside would be multiple heavy deadbolt. So it took a while to get in the door, right? Mm. So I developed a lot of, um, I guess, and then we had the sign on the inside that Michael had made, which was wonderful, which said death outside. So there's <laughs> a skull and crossbone. <laughs> so you had to be very, and then we had a flap when you came in so that passersby wouldn't see that there was anything in there. No oh, canvas flap. But it was hardcore. And I, I finally, um, um, you know, the neighborhood was extremely dangerous then. Mm. Um, I think I think the most uh, accurate lyrical just, uh, depiction of it was one I gave to Justin Broadwick on Yezu, on, on Lifeline. There, I, I did a song called Storm Coming On, where it was just literal right out of my diary entry, you know, like stepping over needles and puddles of piss. You know, so every day it would be on you know, the hypodermic needles and urine from right in front of the front door and um, scary men everywhere trying to entice you, you know, and, and pushers, you know, junkies, you know, everywhere and <clears throat> hardcore. And, and I think you learn very quickly as a woman, I, I, I learned very quickly to cover up, always very baggy, cover up, you know, you wear hats, you wear scarves, baggy. And, and then I learned to uh, carry a, uh, 
a, a large metal crucifix on my key ring. Key, key, it was metal, and, and so it was one of those things where you you you, you, know, you pull it out, and there's a knife inside. Yeah. <laughs> so so they knew the street. People knew that. So they would, and I would be obvious about it as I approached the door, and they they wouldn't come near you. So you have to look like you're dangerous. So then I learned to walk down the street. I think Michael May taught me this. It's a gang thing. You walk down the street. You walk in the middle of the street. You swing a bottle, which is, you know, the implication that you will use it if you have to. So I did all that stuff, and I was never mugged. And I was never, and I had plenty of things said to me that were really horrific, but I never was attacked. And yeah, I remember that. A lot. That, that was right, it was around Tompkins Park when I remember being there about 86, and that was... That wasn't even the worst period of it, but it was, all, it was still quite dicey even at that time. Yeah. In 84, the uh, uh, taxi cab would not go to even go to A. Mm. So yeah. you had to walk there. And I'd been there many times uh, to New York, but I, I didn't even know that the, the, you know, the A's, the, the East Village, I didn't even know it existed. Because, you know, the cabs didn't go there. And the, the furthest down I had been was the Joseph Path Public Theater and uh, Lafayette and I, I, La Mama Annex to see, uh, I'd gone down there to see Panther, the, the, the Philip Glass play. And, and that was the, during the days when Glass was driving a taxi cab, the <laughs> steam composer. So it's like, it was a very different, but I had wonderful early days up there visiting. Like I lived at the Chelsea for a while and, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was really kind of cool. Tom Waits was, was living there. He was hanging out front, you know, and he was asking who was behind the desk because he was behind his rent, you know. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was great, you know. But now, of course, it's all different. So now was, people, was the, people go ahead. Yeah, yeah and that, was that the time when you had to, do, I was reading this guy, I couldn't work out what it was, but you had to do performances or something, this priest ones period, like for... for but, for, yeah. for musicians or rock stars I went or something? Up there, I went up there like on, on, a va- on vacations to see, to go to the opera, to go to Lincoln Center, to go to Carnegie Hall, to, to do things like that. I did that all the time before I moved up there, yeah. But you were also performing as well at that time. Yeah, but I mean, I was doing gallery stuff, like, you know, underground gallery experiment. That's where the walls thing came in. Contact mics. And very mm-hmm. extreme, actually kind of kind of when I look back on it, like a fringe element of, say, the industrial culture handbook, you know, the people, the things that were happening there. I think, I think that uh, in, in, in our own way, that's the kind of stuff we were doing. We were very influenced, as you well remember that movement, you know, we were, we were very influenced by breaking boundaries and taboos like SPK and, you know, the Kuhn transmissions. And so we were, we were all trying to, uh, this, is, this was just the way that we were culturally, you know, I think during those days was just you would do these crazy kind of um, audio uh, you know, installation performances. So that's kind of what that was about. But, yeah, I was doing that before Swans. But. Yeah, I used, to, I used to love those things. It's so rare you see anything like that now, isn't it? <laughs> so was that, was that yeah. in Atlanta? You, before you went to New York, you were in Atlanta, yeah. I think, weren't you? Yeah. It wasn't. So what, was there actually much of a scene of it there? Was this basically you on there your was. own? In a, yeah, there well, was. There was. And, of course, now that's all been um, bulldozed down and it's, um, you know, expensive buildings and it's all compl- that, that's totally gone a long time ago. Yeah. Hmm. So actually, actually, to get to that point, I mean, um, before we went off on a tangent, but you were, you were in New Orleans, New Orleans and, and your father, was he was musical as well, wasn't he? So it wasn't like, you know, if, if you sort of read your bio really quickly, you think you're rebelling against your FBI parents who didn't like any arts or culture, but your father encouraged you to be a singer and he encouraged you to play keyboards, didn't he? Extremely talented artist and musician. Extremely talented. He could draw anything. He was an amazing visual artist. He was a craftsperson. He was head of workshop. He was always making things. Uh, he made jewelry for me. He made all kinds of interesting things for me. He was a, a, had a beautiful singing voice, just incredibly beautiful. He could play guitar. He could play the organ. He, he was very, very talented artist and musician. He had everything to do with encouraging me. Yeah, everything, everything, <laughs> which was the irony because then when I'm wanting to, to pursue it, you know, is, is my life, then, of course, you're saying no. 
that's you know <laughs> that's not a good thing to do. And you know, well, I'm getting mixed signals here because that's what was encouraged. So if it was encouraged to come out and do a song and dance number for the friends when the guests were over, put on an outfit and come out and do, if that's encouraged, then okay, so now I'm going to do it. <laughs> no, <Yeah. laughs> no, was you that can't do it. Was that because your version was a little bit more extreme than his version? No, I think he just uh, um, didn't think it was a solid way to earn a living, and and uh, didn't, but then anything I suggested wasn't uh, wasn't approved of. So I'm not really sure that there was anything I could have done that would have gotten the stamp of approval. I, to this day, I don't know what what that was supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what kind of, what kind of music was he interested in you doing, you know, at home? Oh, uh, well, what he taught me originally was, um, you know, like, um, like, like the music of the, of, you know, the forties or fifties, like, like ballads, you know, like Frank Sinatra stuff, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, like classic kind of, uh, classic kind of middle of the road kind of, you know, ballads and, and, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't look at, I don't, I didn't, and, and then Gilbert and Sullivan and light opera and um, that kind of thing. So I think that, uh, you know, I didn't really relate to this music. I did learn how to sing it quite young. So I know a lot of these old songs, you know, because that my father played them constantly. And, uh, but I mean that, but the thing was, is there was a lot of emphasis on this, of singing in tune, of singing, and then he paid for lessons. He paid for organ lessons. He paid for voice lessons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, I think the idea was, that, well, that's your hobby or something. So I think that, um, you know, to say you want to push it to the next level, and I remember asking him to pay to pay for me to go to Berkeley at Boston to get a formal music degree. They They did not want to do that. So I tried everything under the sun. I went ahead and took uh, all kinds of courses. I took you know, English lit. And I took everything I could creatively, but but I mean, I I don't I don't think they really. I think I think my father was so old fashioned at that point that he probably just wanted me to be a, a wife or a mother. You know, like I think he just wanted me. I think he just wanted me to do something. But then again, you know, classic story. Every boyfriend I ever had wasn't good enough. None mm -hmm. of them were good enough. And they'd come over and he'd give them a handshake, you know. And it was just, it was just, in those days, you know, guys were not, you know, they weren't like that. They weren't, they didn't yeah. want to do the manly handshake. I mean, things were <laughs> yeah. changing. You know, guys were getting softer, more feminine or whatever. I hate to use that word, but they were getting more, you know, they weren't, they weren't the, mm. Mm. so I think that it was <laughs> an impossible situation. But then I have to know, as I've said in numerous interviews, I have to note it was only upon his passing, his dying, that I got the courage together to to go to New York and to try to do it. Mm. So I think I think um, you know it was kind of an, a hurdle, an obstacle for me to to overcome. Just yeah. psychologically, if nothing else, you know, if nothing you do. And I think as, you know, you kind of grow up with the reward system where you want your want the approval, you know, you want daddy's approval and you can never get daddy's approval. So I think that, I think I understand now more about his world and, and what his ideas were. But at the time, it, it went, you know, it, it was something I did kind of, kind of, I definitely rebelled against. And, and then he didn't like when I started becoming um, very creative with, you know, the way I looked and that kind of thing. He didn't like it. I mean, there was a time when I had a, wasn't really a mohawk, but I had like, I had like a orange kind of an arrow and it kind of, it was very like, you know, he didn't <laughs> know. He didn't like that. So I think that I think that any kind of um, extreme to him, not to me, uh, I think he didn't he didn't like it. And then he did get a job promotion where the whole family would have moved to San Francisco. And I know for a fact he turned it down because he was afraid of what would happen to me there. Okay, because there was a lot more of it there than there was where you were. Yeah. And of course <laughs> then that would have been a game changer. I probably would have been a rock star at age twenty. <laughs> 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 I was gonna go there. Yeah. 
But I mean, yeah, so now I understand more. But but then there was a lot of interesting things about him too. For example, he didn't go to church. He had a Buddha. He burned incense. He read, he had the compassionate Buddha by his bedside. And so my mother was Roman Catholic. So it was very interesting. It was only near the end of his life that he uh, he converted as a gift to her before he died. That's and fascinating. So that they had a very romantic and, and loving relationship. I, I, I kind of saw him as the ideal in terms of that because he was always making her little notes and gifts and romantic all the time, you know. And I think that that's not that normal, you know, or, or, or usual these days mm. for people to be like that. But they had this great romance. And when he died, my mother wouldn't even think about anyone else. So. So there were a lot of good things about their relationship and about him as him as a as what he accomplished. And he was completely self-made. I mean, he put himself to college. He put him. He, paid, he he was completely. So that I have to respect. I just think he he didn't know what to do with the kids. You know, he didn't know he didn't know really how to direct. You know, or how to. Um, but I mean, he taught me a lot, and I, and you know, the older I get, the more I, I realize how much of him he, there is in me. So that's that's something I'm trying to be less brutal about my assessment now. <laughs> I'm just thinking that I'm thinking in a really odd way, your life is very similar to his. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like so. Yeah. Okay, so you're a covert artist, and he was a covert government agent <laughs> moving around. Yeah. And, yeah. And, but, um, with that interest in Buddhism, because you got you got a big interest in Tibetan Buddhism, haven't you? Oh, for a long time, for for well before it became trendy, yes, for sure. I mean, I was studying uh, studying it in college, and I was reading all the literature. And I mean, I, this was it's been a part of my life. It's again, it's tied in for me personally. It's tied into to uh, to creative expression and to inspiration. Um, and and uh, there's nothing more um, uh, vivid than these visualizations with the, the mandalas and the deities and the consorts. There's, that doesn't get any more extreme than that. And if people haven't tried it through a guided visualization meditation, they don't know. They they can't possibly know because it's it's so detailed that it is hallucinogenic and it's it's done completely without any outside substances it's just done through those visualizations and through meditation so that is something that inspired me um uh, and and also uh just the feeling that i've i've had when i've been around the monks and around the dalai lama it, it's been a very an amazing like a like a like a sun inside my chest like a fire like a highness of fire and so it so all of these things have helped me a lot. And, and so as a Westerner, I would say when I talked to a Buddhist journalist one time, I would say, I have to say for me, I'm going to have to use the cop out in a way of saying I've, I've also used it as psychotherapy. So I think that Buddhism is helpful for Westerners as a form of psychotherapy. Is it also the, the artist side of it as well, though? You talk about the lucigenic side, the artistry of it. I and mean, does that appeal mm -hmm. to you the same way that the music appear, appeals to you as well, that mm -hmm. it creates these pictures? And it's actually, in a sense, the Tibetan Buddhism is, is almost like an art form as well. Definitely, most definitely. And it's, it's, pos it's you know, one of the more extreme in terms of the ceremonies and the, the rituals. And that, to me, is beautiful. And that's where I, and I, I, you know, there's so many different branches and ideas, you know, like Zen Buddhism. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, they all have, they're all useful. They're all, they're all good, good uh, paths. And I do try to incorporate that in every single album I ever do. But it's not beating you over the head with it. It's, it's for those that want to, want to, they're looking, they're going to see, they're going to see what I'm saying. <laughs> and it's always, it's always there. Every single one, it's there. And that the tour with Father Murphy, we did one of the, one of the songs with, which had a mantra throughout it, you know, which is about, it just repeats over and over, you know, nothing is here to stay. Pain is not punishment. Pleasure is not reward, you know? And so this is, this is going against the, the, you know, the, the traditional, um, uh, say Christian type of uh, uh, idea that you know 
know you're being punished because you're bad and you're being rewarded because you were good. So, so this, this, this side, this, that song goes against all that with those mantras. And so we did that every single night on the tour and it was, it was like our, our last song. And it was just like this highlight of the, <laughs> of the <laughs> set, I think, for those that understood it. it and of course, they're standing there in their priest robes, so it was just perfect. <laughs> That was a joy. That was the most joyous tour imaginable touring with them. So, yeah. So, in, in a weird way, would this be what you first heard when you first heard Swans on the radio at Atlanta? The, the repetitive nature of the music, the mantra of the music, and the very uh, the phraseology, very simple words making very powerful statements. It sounds yeah. very similar to what what you're doing there, but coming through Tibetan Buddhism. And would well, it be, the, I'm not saying I'm not saying they're a copy or anything, but would, would no, it be? No. Would it be like some yeah. sort of connection? I did hear. I did hear the mantra. I did hear the repetitive uh, music. Um, I like that, and I think that that's um, just how I uh, think and think of music. And so I did respond to that. And when I heard "Power for Power," I thought for sure that it was a mantra, and um, I was very, very drawn to it. Uh, it sounded very tribal. It sounded very. Um, you know, uh, uh, otherworldly to me. And I never heard the band as, um, I never heard the band as, as having anything to do with New York or the cities or any of that. I, I always understood it as metaphor. And I think that's why um, we kind of clicked, and Michael and I clicked, because I think I got the bigger picture. Now, I probably put a whole lot into it that he wasn't even intending, and maybe he would disagree completely, but, but that was how I responded to it initially, and that's, that's definitely what drew me to it, was the mantra, the minimalism, the repetitive nature of the, of the music, for sure. I mean, I just, just want to backtrack slightly before. Um, when, when did pop culture still first come into your life? You know, if, if, you know your, your father's teaching always ninth, 40 standards, etc. But was the music from your generation which probably was my generation as well. But, you know, first coming in, what was the first thing that was yours? Well, see, I had brothers that were uh, like around around nine years older than me, eight, nine years older. And so they were already listening to stuff that that I wasn't, that, my, that kids my that, you know, p- people that were not, in my school were not. Like I was, I heard, um, you know, uh, Magical Mystery Tour and, you know, Beatles. And I, I heard all that, like my brother bringing it home from college and, and, and playing that for me. And so, so I, I, I was kind of tuned into my older brother's world, even though I was too young to be part of that yet, I was still brought into that. And so my older, one of my older brothers was, was responsible for me starting to wear Indian beads and, and, uh, you know, <laughs> and listening to psychedelic music, <laughs> much to my, much to my parents' horror. <laughs> um, I started, I started hanging out with him, you know, and, and uh, he, uh, I, you know, that's how I learned. That's how I heard all this stuff. Was through, mm-hmm. through my brother Sam, and so, so I think that I think that um, that was the advantage that I had. Now they were old, older to the degree that they weren't in the same school as me. They had already gone on, so they weren't able to protect me or keep me from being, you know, getting in trouble when I was in school. Right? <laughs> they weren't mm-hmm. there, so they weren't protectors in that way. But they did. Um, I did hear, uh, you know music and 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 learn about culture and all that through them because they were already experiencing it and indeed that one brother um was responsible for my very first trip to europe because he was there and so he opened the door for me uh learning you know and being and being attracted to you know, countries that had older, just an older heritage, you know, and just, and, and just a different way that I saw then as being really uh, sophisticated. And so I was, I was, and that's, and they aren't, they are, but, but I mean, that was my attractant to Europe too, was through this brother. So he, he turned me on to music that was, you know, of his era. And he also turned me on to different cultures to, you know, cause he was living in Europe. So I think that I think that that had was the advantage I had. <laughs> I was I got I got I got a little boost. 
And what with psychedelic music, which is amazing because it's so mesmerising, but did, did you feel there's a sense of other to that, that this is a portal to another world that, you know, not the time you wouldn't realise it's going to lead to Swans, New York, Tibetan Buddhism, da 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 But there's a, there's a sense that there's something beyond the top 40, there's something out there. Would that be psychedelic music that did that or would there be other well, influences? Well, yeah. Yeah, for sure, and and this this uh, this attracted to the different music that was happening. Um, that led to um, to I guess I would say I don't I don't know what it's called like um, British blues psychedelia, you know. So that that kind of led because everything was coming out of England in those days. So I I think that um, I think that this started an entire trajectory for me you know because I when I was in school I got a a job at a record store and so I think that I started learning about music working in the record store and 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 I was getting I was getting promos and free records and so I started you know going into all kinds of different worlds and I was able to get um, you know free admission to concerts with that connection so I started going to everything so I mean, I, I immersed myself. I was I was immersing myself in jazz. I was immersing myself in oh, you know, circle jerks, punk rock, and I was immersing myself in uh, new wave. I was immersing myself in you know pretty much every genre, you know. And and so I think uh, rock, you know, I was going to Van Halen, and I was going to you know Talking Heads and Diva. I was going to everything I, I, and so so i think just having this open mind of, of i guess i would say what you call input because i think when you're growing up you should have input before you do output so you just just mm. bring it all in bring it all in like a library just mm. bring it all in hear every kind of music you know hear it all whether it's country folk whatever it is just hear it all let it all come in and absorb it, you know, and don't, and, and just have an open mind so that it all comes in there and, and it's going to be like this, this, you know, stew or something. You know, it's going to be like this, and you can create from that. You, you've heard so much that it's all in there as a vocabulary. And this is a vocabulary that I draw on it all the time because I, I know I've heard every possible genre at this point. So it's kind of like I, I've immersed myself in it. So I have that vocabulary and I can kind of recognize that vocabulary and you can call upon it, you know? And so it's like learning languages. So it's very important to have it here as, you know, as much music as you possibly can and not have this snobby kind of, you shouldn't immediately, Oh, I only like this. Well, you're, you're closing the door, you know, you're closing the door. So when you're doing the experiments in the art galleries with the sound and you're, you're getting to what so-called, uh, more of an industrial kind of vibe. Would that, would that be at that time? Would, would that be your main uh, style that you're working in within the pram style, or was that just one of many, many little tangents you were doing? I mean, it just eclecticism. Is that what you mean? Just yeah, I just wonder if you'd honed it all down into a more sort of noise thing. Or, or, you know, or just this idea of making uh, experimental industrial sort of sounds in, in the gallery, or if that was just, you know, you, you still had, you still liked a lot of stuff, and that's just one thing you were doing, or if you just listen to everything and you just close it all down into into, into like into, well, into a vision. Well, it depends on what it depends on what era you're talking about, you know. Oh, this is uh, a. Um, oh, that sorry. Era, yeah, yeah, yeah. That era of the of the gala, of the industrial culture you know movement and all that that w- without without that era happening the radio show when i first heard swans was involved with that that kind of music so it was a radio show that only played it was a, from one of the local uni- local uh, universities they would only they only played that particular stuff so that's where i first heard you know, and starts in Denoy Belton. That's where I first heard SPK. That's where I first heard Swans. That's where I first heard, you know, all of these, 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 these bands that were, you know, part of what they were calling industrial music. And so, so this was that was during that period uh, before, you know, before moving to New York. That's all I was immersing myself in, and that was. That comes with its own culture <laughs> that came with uh, the male art, which I was part of. That came with the cassette culture. We were trading cassettes all over the world. That came with the uh, distribution of, um, 
underground experimental music on on tapes and we would elaborately package the tapes. I mean, that was the whole scene. Mm -hmm. And so I think that without that scene, that is where I first heard Swans. And so that, and I was interested in two groups really heavily. And one was Unstertin to Neubauten and one was Swans. And so I was very heavily um, um, uh, uh, you know, listening to every single thing that was, you know, and analyzing what they were doing. And so I think that with, with swans that correlated with the other thing I was doing then, which was, I was, I was, uh, weightlifting and I was uh, a very different, uh, person. I had a buzz cut and I was, uh, super strong and I, I lifted weights. I worked out for sometimes five hours a day. And, and so I wore, you know, Doc Martens and overalls and had a buzz cut. <laughs> so, so, so I was, uh, I was, I was pretty yeah, I see, tough. I was pretty see some tough. I was, I was interested in that. Was it, was it, was this for like, almost like an art thing, turn yourself into an art form? Like, um, there was an artist in Manchester in the seventies called Linda. Uh, who's was a brilliant artist, and she she did bodybuilding as well, or weightlifting. And, but she was doing it in a, almost like an art thing that you know your body is a canvas and you right. re- recreate your body. That's how you could paint your body in a sense by that's changing exactly the shape of your body. It. That's that's mm. exactly it. it and and uh, you can you, when you learn, you can control that and you can do that and push yourself and you see the results. And then the bodybuilding, um, that is what opened the door to the other form of that, what you're talking about, which was tattooing. So that's when I entered into, um, you know, and, and most of those happened in New York City, uh, just uh, just prolific tattooing. But, but I made the decision to make them where they can be covered easily so that you know, no one knows I have them. And so, so, so they be covered with them. <laughs> Because I wanted to be able to blend in and hang out with my mother and uh, not embarrass <laughs> everybody, <laughs> so so I uh, so I, so that's definitely a form of body modification, the tattooing, the, the, the weight lifting, and um, and plus you just have your own strength. And the thing was is that um, I think Michael even talked about this. It's like when I first moved up there, I had the with the boxing stuff. I had the calluses because the teacher was like the fingers that stay together slay together, and so. Mm-hmm you know, you were kicking to keep this. And so it was just like this idea of weaponry of the body. And I think that that, that confidence that you have walking down the street uh, up there, I think that they, they read that and they know that you're not going to be easy to, <laughs> to tangle with. So they, they don't bother you. So I think that all that confidence of the bodybuilding had a lot to do with the confidence to try to get into the group as well. So all it all works it? together. Yeah, and it's and also an interest in extremes. So it's there's no, mm-hmm. it's not like a your average idea of a musician smokes a bit of dope, potters about, plays guitar for five minutes. You know, that's that's right. a cliche version of a musician. But the, the world that well, you well, yeah, and 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 also you know to 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 when I think back on you know the persona, the person I built then was very minimalist and very tough and could carry things. And so I think that, um, you know, the first tour that they did in Europe, I carried a lot of stuff and lugged stuff around and kept up with stuff because, uh, 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 not judging, but they were, you know, smoking and drinking. And so I was completely teetotal, straight edge. And so, so it's like I was kind of a very useful, you know what I mean, person because you could count on me to, to, to take care of stuff and to, 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 to carry it and to make, get it done. And, and I never went out. I mean, the whole time I was in that project, I mean, I hate, Michael hates that word, but I mean, band project. I, I never, I never went to the bars. I did. I was never part of it. I wasn't smoking, wasn't drinking, wasn't drinking. And so, so I think that I was outsider class because I moved into a culture that that was just part of the part of the culture, and I mm. didn't understand that culture. Uh, mm. And for years, I was um, vegan and. and, and vegetarian vegan. And, and so the first tour and even when i was um you know in the group specifically the children of god tour through eastern europe i stayed this is this is where i learned this is where buddhism comes in i learned that i, I in buddhism if there's nothing to eat or, or the monks are on tour they're going to eat at burger king mm-hmm. right so i was not adhering i was not flexible i was adhering rigidly 
I was rigid. And that's not what you do when you're, you're practicing Buddhism. You're not. So I was rigid, and so I didn't adapt, and then I got, and got deathly ill because there was literally nothing to eat. The mm-hmm. only thing to eat was sausages, sausages. That was it. There were no vegetables. There were no fruit. There was potatoes and sausages. So the band was all eating, you know, and full, you know, <laughs> and, and I wasn't. Oh, yeah. And the only thing to drink was orange pop because so we couldn't drink the water. If they didn't have water. Yeah, yeah. So I got incredibly ill because I was getting things. And I remember we went to this restaurant in a hotel that at one time been very, very fancy on a beach. And, of course, it was all kind of dilapidated, but they still had waiters and outfits, and they still had a dance room, which is interesting. And I remember on the menu was the Sir Peas in the can. So that was like this elegant item, and, and, and I, I was so happy to have peas. And I, um, But, see, I, I maintained I was rigid, and I was starving. And, you know, and so, so when we got off of that, which was quite a long tour, very hard, brutal tour, um, that's when I. That's when it hit me, and that's when I was sick as hell, and I did not get well. My body just rebelled against me, and it, it just, just all hell broke loose in my body. <laughs> and and, and uh, my mother uh, was very angry and upset, and so she flew me down. It took me to Emory University, and they ran tests on me, and that's when the doctor told me that I had just basically destroyed myself by <laughs> not eating anything. <laughs> and so that's what I learned. If you want to. Now, see, now it's different. Now you can go on tour, and the promoters are going to... But then those days, that was madness. And you'd go to Germany or parts of Europe in those days, and Michael would say, you know, she doesn't eat me to the waiter, and they would be like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and so... It, now, see, I'm happy that other people can do, you know, people can do what they need to do, but a musicians, no, there's no way touring musicians could, could adhere to something like that unless you have a whole suitcase packed with some kind of packaged food. You could not. You could not. <laughs> so, see, that was very rigid of me, mm. and that is I'm not just- what a, a Buddhist would do. So, so I learned my lesson there, like I have to accept what is offered and I just have to be more flexible. Oh, did you, that's you, just brought back so many memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. East Europe, yeah. In the, in the I 80s. mean, if you if yeah. you if you get plenty of beer to drink and and vodka and sausage and all that, then that's fine. But if you don't do any of that, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's difficult. It's so yeah. We're laughing, but I mean, it's like you know, it's kind of sad. But but the point was is that I was. You know, that's what I was like. So, so that p- person was strong, but also the internally, I got very sick. Mm. So I had the muscles, keep... but I didn't have the inter- the constitu- internal constitution got destroyed. I don't, think, I don't think many people have an internal constitution for an eight-week yeah. European tour would have <laughs> <laughs> in those days. So the first time you went to New York and you went to interview Michael for your fanzine, well, I mean, was it was it was an element of that? Uh, they see, was it they saw you as like a virtually wow, somebody just turned up who's actually a female ver- embodiment of of swans, or was it a slow process? Do they just think who's this annoying woman? Won't she, won't she just please go away? Or was it somewhere in between the two? Or <laughs> I think. Um... The questions that I asked were unusual or and interesting. So I think that he, he, he Michael responded to the, the questions, uh, knew that it wasn't, they weren't the same old questions. But also I did refer to, to it as an art project, which is what I saw it as, which is what I always did see it as, which is what I still see it as, <laughs> which is what I say it is. And he, got, he did get on the defensive. And he said, he said, art project, I think we're a rock band. <laughs> and, I, and that stays down in my mind as I was like, what? <laughs> so, so I saw that was kind of a, you know, little alarm went off, like, what? And that's when I thought, oh, is that being sarcastic or what is that? Because, come on, clearly it wasn't. Clearly there's a lot more going on than that. So, um, so I think that there is uh, – and then, you know, I, I was just, just uh, um, driven 
I guess you'd say, to get up there and, 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 and under any obstacles, you know, under any obstacles. And uh, it was hard. I mean, when mm-hmm. I first, first went up there, um, before we moved to the bunker, which was the raw space that they were rehearsing in, um, it was the three of us, Harry Crosby, who was the bass player at the time, and, and uh, Michael and I in this tiny tenement apartment on 2nd Street. And that was hardcore because you'd enter the front door and there's the stove to the right, the gas stove, and there's the bathtub right there. <laughs> so anybody coming in, if you were in the bath, would be like, so after a while, you're just, you're just oblivious to people coming and going and you're bathing. You know? it's like, <laughs> there's no privacy, in other words, at all. <laughs> yeah, so all, see, that the- was good, though. That was good because that opened the door to the dressing rooms I would experience. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. They seem like seem like luxury in comparison. (laughs) Members of the band are coming and going. They don't even look. You know, everybody's seeing each other. So it's it's kind of like that helped me to get over any kind of concerns about that. But yeah, so that was really hardcore. This this idea of the the tub right next, and then of course I learned that that was the norm up there for for those apartments. Um, But yeah, so 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 the questions. I think that's what stands out is. the question uh, that that got the big reaction, and um, and then I think we talked about um, um, bloody hacked flesh and in, in, in pronounced in German, and did he feel a relationship to 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 the flesh and his lyrics because his lyrics seemed about the body. That was mm-hmm. something we talked about, um, which of course they always pertain to that, and then. Um, I think that so there was some kind of a, a interest there, and then uh, then there was discussion of um, just being useful. And the first job I had was sorting through his writing. He had this old rickety typewriter, so I was basically a grunt worker. I, I, I would go get press kits, physical press kits, um, photocopied. Norman was doing that as well, and I remember trudging through a blizzard to go to the copy place, which was quite some distance to get things photocopied. And, and, you know, so I was basically the person that would get the mail. And then I started answering fan mail, mailing out promo records, just being a gopher helper, help, helper person, just a helper. Mm-hmm. This is you know, a long a period of that before there was any um, interest in music. Uh, after the first tour, um, Harry uh, uh, and Rolly, drummer and bass, they both quit. There were some difficulties on that tour. I'll just put it elegantly. <laughs> well, in- inevitably, there in those some, conditions. Some fighting. Yeah. There was some fighting. <laughs> and I learned through that too because I'm, that was a great tour. I'm so glad I was on that tour because sometimes I was the only audience member in the entire room. Mm. And so I could lay down on the floor and just hear the frequencies rolling through my body. And that was a wonderful way to hear it in those days. And I really loved Rolly's drumming. And um, but Michael Rolly was a, a you know training as a background as a, a jazz drummer, and so he does all these fills, and it's really complicated drumming. And I thought it sounded really good in the context of the other instrumentation. But Michael, I remember this one show, he said he had played too many fills; he was too busy, mm. and that was a red flag for me because that would be said to me later. And, and, um, and so they had a fight, like a physical, and then he quit. So then, so the point was, is that then they're gone. So you've got positions to fill, right? So Harry also played these sounds. They had sounds and they were played with his foot rolling the volume pedal on the cassette deck. So that out the window is decided to recreate sounds, atmospheres and noisy sounds on a sampling keyboard, which had just come out. So that became my job, and then uh, Al was hired to play bass. So this was all happening in 85, so replacement of, of the members, changing the sound because of the new members, the new sound, new instrumentation, and also um, they'd just gotten the, uh, the record deal from Some Bazaar, for the branch of Com- Some Bazaar, K422. So, so all this was happening then which is why there wasn't a lot of touring then and then uh the first show for me and for al was the tour in december of, of i think it was december of solstice in 85 at the in la and 
so, I mean, all that was, you know, was, was, was a uh, proving ground, proving ground for me to see, you know, if I could, could, could uh, handle it. And I did audition for it and I, I, everyone agreed that I would, you know, could do it, but that keyboard was very, very loud. And so we had to accommodate for it in the PA. Mm-hmm. And um, it was, it's was really interesting working in, in, in that setting um, because again, um, I was frequently told with my singing as well as my playing, I was playing too many notes, mm-hmm. I was too busy and um, strip it down and make it more minimal. And then as I've told the story, the last tour I did, um, <clears throat> Which could very well be the reason I, did. <laughs> I, uh, I just decided to go with it because you can't fire me at this point because I'm, you know, it's the last thing. So I was very extreme in my performances, in my opinion, very, very extreme. And, and I think that I, I enjoyed that. And I don't think they were too theatrical. So when you mm-hmm. say too theatrical in the context of the group I joined, where I'm playing keyboard and I'm watching Michael in his underwear or <laughs> completely nude. You know, the, you can't be, you know what I mean, theatrical if you're going to do that. You can't say I'm <laughs> too theatrical. Did, did he have any notion of your musicality? Because you could play keyboards very well. Did they have any idea or did they just think you just, there's just somebody's around who could play a bit of keyboards? <laughs> you know? No, no, but here's the thing. They didn't want that. He did Well, he, they, they, they just do what he, I mean, he was the person telling you what to do. And so I think that he, um, he wanted things to be minimal and um, uh, uh, have a lot of space in between the notes. And so there's a famous rehearsal for me in my mind. When I, and, of course, I recorded a lot of these rehearsals. They were very interesting. I, uh, when he had left the room, um, I asked, uh, uh, I think I asked Norman and Al, or, or at least Norman, what, what was you know the, the key or notes that they were dominant in what they were doing during a particular song because you know you got to realize we played at the volume of a jet aircraft <laughs> taken off and and i wore earplugs but sometimes you'd have to, you're trying to figure out what they were you know where everybody was doing you have to look at their hands because it's like you couldn't hear all you heard was a square wave sometimes <laughs> you know not how i would rehearse but <laughs> that's what we did so he came in the back of the door right when I was getting the answer. I just completely lost it. Like, don't ask him what he's playing. Don't play what he's... I didn't say I was going to play what he was playing. I just want to know so that what I'm doing works with what he's doing. <laughs> but no, no, no. See? So it, it, was be, just, it, was, it was hard. It had to be on feel. Is that, what, is that what he was saying? You just had to feel what he was. and Without knowing, you know, because you can't hear what notes he's playing. So that, that, was, that was one of the things I learned. But So you have to constantly strip it back. During a live performance, if I got really into it, right, and I added, maybe I played a bit more than I was supposed to because I was in a trance and I was totally feeling it. And then we got off the stage, I'd be screamed at for doing that. Then I started retaliating and yelling back, and that wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you know, I probably wouldn't be that way. I'd be like, okay, what can I do? But see, at that point, I kind of felt entitled, like I was contributing my own thing because I had been the longest member in the group at that point, mm-hmm. other than him. Everybody had quit and come and go and come and go except for me. And so I think that um, I kind of felt like it was partly my group as well. So I feel like that I should have had more input. And so, so I think that, um, you know, there was a lot of arguing about that. But the red flag for me was what he said to really about the too many notes. So too many fills. So I think that once you learn that, that the, 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 the aesthetic was the minimalism and the space and the sound, um, and maybe it's not articulated to you. You just have to figure it out, which I did. Mm-hmm. And then in the studio, same way. I got very good at hearing exactly what would sound great, taking half of it off and just playing partly what I was going to do and, and not even resolving it in the way that I heard, which I would do in my own work, just kind of keeping it without resolution. And in singing uh, parts and playing parts for other guest musicians, which I did all the time 
for people that would guest on songs in the burning world. I was singing, you know, the, the, the violin part on God damn the sun. I was doing all kinds of things. So I think that, I think that you, you learn at that point, like you, you give them a, a repetitive thing to do. They can nuance it. And then it's going to probably be stripped back even more. Mm-hmm. So because you were in a relationship with Michael at this time, does that change the role that you have in the band? Um, I think it depends on where you are in your life in general, if I was to answer that question for other people. But I think in my case, it's where, I, where we both were at that time in our, our life. But the positive thing that I learned, which actually helped me, was that it wasn't the case as much as I thought it was how much I, you know, my feelings would get hurt and that kind of thing. Um, because on the, one of the tours that the, the new, the new group, the new version that has started a few years ago, right. Um, there, I, it's very, it's very, it's noted, I think in either the book that Nick Salisbury wrote or the documentary that Mark Corsia did in that, um, they were somewhere, Australia or somewhere, maybe New Zealand, I don't know, and they wrote a letter and they gave it to him saying to stop yelling at us during, you know, we can't take it anymore, just stop the yelling. And so, and then I talked to some some rather well-known musicians that are pretty tough dudes in a, in a rather famous rock group, and they, <laughs> they looked at me and they told me privately when I went to the show, the dressing room, they told me privately that, they had been at a show where they had seen that on the stage and that, you know, if they would not have been able to, if the, you, know, you couldn't dare do that to them. Like you wouldn't, like they, they, you know, no, that, that you'd be done. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so I think that, <laughs> so I think that um, my point and what I'm getting at is that I thought it was because of that dynamic, but then I learned it wasn't because it happened when I wasn't even there with people that he wasn't personally involved with. Yeah. So then that, that helped me kind of go, ah. <laughs> because <laughs> I kept thinking it was, it was, that was it. But then see, it wasn't. Yeah. It's just the way so he is. Was. <laughs> so that made me feel better. And then um, um, I uh, have done, you know, I did done many of my own. Uh, mm-hmm. recording sessions and tours with all kinds of people, including some pretty macho dudes, nurses. And, the, and, and there was no, that's not, no, it doesn't happen in the rehearsals or, or um, touring. So what I learned was is that it could be a lot of fun. It could be wonderful to, to tour, you know, without any of those, those emotions. That's not what happens. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, it's it- never happened to me on any of my tours. So, so it's kind of like that's when I thought, well, it was just our particular dynamic. No, it maybe, but also I haven't experienced it since, and also it's happened to others since me. So I think that I don't know if that's still going on now or not, because I, I feel like without without being um, overstepping boundaries, which I probably definitely am, I think that maybe that had something to do with. You know, and, and I think that now that that's apparently gone for, for some time now, that maybe that's different. Because mm. we all know that that adds to, to things being, being uh, out of hand when you're, when you're, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a lot more charming to interview now than he used to be. So, <laughs> yeah, so I'm thinking that maybe, maybe I haven't, you know, I don't know, but maybe that's mm. not. Has, wasn't an element once that was addressed because I know that, that he addressed that issue because he couldn't keep going that way. Mm-hmm. So I think that um, I wish that that had been the case for me. I wish that that had been the case because I well, was around yeah. the exact opposite. I was around, it was just got really, really bad at one point. It looked so bad, <clears throat> so bad. So I think that um, that could have something to do with it. But it definitely was not, I don't think it was interpersonal uh, dynamic in terms of uh, you know, relationship with someone. I, I think it just has to do with, with that particular person and, and what they were going through then is what I would say now. Because otherwise I would have experienced it 
afterwards, mm-hmm. or I would have, or the stories and things that I know about happening would not have happened. So I, I disagree that it was, it was, that was, it had anything to do with it. Well, what's, what's interesting about that is that your influence, even though he's got this very singular vision, and which, which I really admire, and obviously quite difficult to work with, which I kind of admire as well, actually, in an artist, but your influence on the sound of the band and even the whole shape of the band is really profound. You know, once, once, once you're in there, it does change. And that's got to be, it's got to be some of your energy going in there, or maybe the way he's reacting to your energy. And this is quite fascinating, this kind of weird symbiosis that goes on in that period when you have I more. Agree. Yeah. I agree. And I think live, um, the dynamic was fascinating once I was able to share vocals. I think that that was something the audience enjoyed. And I think that uh, that dynamic was very exciting to, to the audience. I mean, I would see it. And, mm. and there would be a reaction when I would come out and get behind the keyboard and, and approach the mic. There was a, a anticipation and excitement. So it kind of gave this relief of the energy, you know, male-female energy. And also um, I think that uh, that was one of the good things about those years. Uh, also, um, yeah, the way I would look at it now is um, – you bring in an element that has this skill set, knowledge, training, whatever, and and um, has heard uh, you know a lot more variety of music than you have, and so I think that um, that was uh, seized upon, that that was that was uh, 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 utilized because they the person had that. So I think that's some of it. But I mean, I, 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 I do believe there was a golden period of just really welcoming my ideas and really allowing me to, to uh, express. If you look at um, the skin album, Blood, Women, Roses, Coming Before Children of God, and then you look at Children of God, well, that was uh, an album where I, I mean, I wrote songs, you know, and I wrote the, the music for the song. And so there was a sharing of songwriting credit. And I think that, What's interesting about it is that even though I continue to add the melodies and to have the ideas, then that was removed to where it was like you didn't get that credit anymore. So, you know, you could say, well, I still did this and still did that. So then he, then he began to have the idea that, well, a song is just me on my couple of, couple of chords and, and the vocal. Okay, well, if you flesh out that melody and you add another melody and then you you take that vocal and you completely refine it to where it's a true melody. To me, that is a type of songwriting. So I think that, I think that there was a lot of conflict. And for me was, I just, I just simply wanted to get the credit where credit was due. I simply wanted to be recognized as, as, you know, not just say eye candy on the stage in those days, you know, (laughs) I was just, I was a serious artist. And, and so I kind of wanted that respect and that 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 credit and that attention for for, for my brains and for my for my skills. So what I was doing. So I think that I did begin to feel a little, um, I guess, disappointed in that, mm-hmm. kind of resentful. And well, um, yeah. But I but I do feel that you know, children of God wouldn't have happened if he hadn't have allowed me to to. Uh, with open arms to, you know, to bring in, you know, and, and then some things, weird things happen in that album. That, you know, his label is just getting ready to reissue that uh, on vinyl, which is great. However, um, it was a bittersweet. I loved living in Cornwall. I loved being uh, at Sawmill Studios and, and exploring uh, the island and exploring all those hills. And I actually saw the red, you know, the, the, the hunters, you know, the, the horseback team, the red coats with the foxhounds. I actually saw that when I was there. It's like yeah, yeah. straight out of straight out of a movie. <laughs> straight out of a movie. Yeah. And, and I saw it and um, climbing through fences, and then the sheepdog come running after me because he's you know he's around the sheep. So I loved it, but but again, uh, musically, and then we had, did a lot of experiments, setting off fireworks on the on the water and ro- doing the road. He and I got in the rowboat and recorded mm-hmm. all the. It was great. And we had a compound. We all had cabins. We had our own cook and everything was great. That's luxurious. Not many people get to do that anymore. Mm. And very expensive, I'm sure. So, so I think that um, 
that was great. But then musically, here's the famous story for In My Garden. I wrote In My Garden when I was in college. I, I had a, um, a stand-up, an upright piano in my room. And so I wrote that, and there's two distinct melodies there. So we're going to do that song. And then Al one day is sitting in the, uh, the main cabin, which has the TV set, and he's sitting on the floor just doing his fingering, just looking at TV. And I, I said, hey, that, he goes, I'm just practicing my fingering. And I was like, oh, well, those notes you're playing, they go with my melody and my song that we're working on, you know. And it might be cool if you, you know, throw those in there. So then he gets so many credit. <laughs> <laughs> and to this day, he's like, I, I thought I was playing on something else. I didn't know. It was <laughs> yeah. do and it like, has never been corrected. And I'm like, whatever. But the thing was, is that, you know, so see, that's something I did in college. I mean, it's like, yeah. and so, so it's just kind of crazy how that went, too, in terms of credit and, and songwriting. And then when we were done, we were working on the songwriting credits for the liner notes i left the room and it turned into the screaming match of everybody arguing and wanting credit i think that had a lot to do with him like forget it not doing this anymore because it was just like it turned into too much tension you know Mm -hmm. so i can Mm -hmm. understand that as well you know and and but i also think i i had uh a different attitude about it because in those days um, I thought we were going to be doing it forever, you know what I mean? So I, I didn't, I mean, I didn't think, I thought eventually everything was going to be great. And I wasn't really worried about money or royalties or, <laughs> cause mm-hmm. I saw it as like a family thing. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's another true. lesson I have for women. What? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's always these are always difficulties in groups, aren't they? Who makes what? Yeah, and, I know plenty, yeah. of, plenty of people that are not together anymore that had created groups that were in groups, you know, for years as a couple, and then they're not in it anymore. So, so do you think? Um, and I want to talk about collaboration here because because what you do a lot of time is collaboration. I guess your first musical collaboration is Swans with Michael, and it like the way you work, and you work in different ways in different collaborations, but. Just want to go back to Swans before I get onto that. Do you think you allowed some, him to pull sort of different out of himself as well? Not, I mean, not just he's pulling. You, you know, you say you've got your skill sets. He's bringing them into the band, etc., which is brilliant and it's interesting. But also, he's he's reacting to you back the other way around, thinking I can. I mean, there was one interview where, where he tells you he explains you to sing differently. You know, drop the G's or something. But you also explained to him how to sing because you learn to sing properly. Don't sing from the throat like we all do. That's why we all can't talk now. Well, he was just doing this shouting. He was just doing this kind of sloganeering and shouting. And when they were in Switzerland, uh, you know, I I was in the studio when they were recording and I, I was right outside the vocal booth. And I said, you know, do these, hold out your breath, do these long notes that come from the chest. Like, you know, try, just try it as an experiment. And it sounded incredible. So I think that that was very important that he learned he could do, just get the breath, just, take, you know, extend the note mm-hmm. and do singing instead of just the, just the barking, basically, you know, the shouting. And, 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 and it really did, it turned into a whole new way of doing things. So that was really good. Oh yeah, for sure. I was uh, not singing like a, you know, to use his expression, as an American, uh, because I was um, using training. I was pronouncing the, my G's uh, very much in the way that perhaps people would speak. Uh, speak doing, um, I don't know, in England, perhaps you know, like the pro- I don't. Know, there's so many different varieties of English in England. I don't know what what type of English it would be but you know and and, and English and English where you you might say I'm going going to going well you know and here you might say I'm gonna (laughs) no 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 my father would have killed me if I had said gonna (laughs) we had to speak proper English 
Yeah. But the thing was, I sang that way. I had, and, and I think so, and the only thing I could relate it to would be semi, maybe in those days, some kind of goth performers might be singing that way. Might be kind of a goth way of singing where you're almost, you know, kind of singing almost like you have an a British accent. And you're kind of, you know, it's kind of a precious way of singing. So I was, I was singing with too many consonants with my, um, my American, uh, my, my English. And so I think that, um, I learned to kind of drop the G's and, and uh, be soft around the consonants. And then that opened up the door to be using the Southerner vernacular. So if you listen to, say, black, my version of Nick Drake's Black Eyed Dog, I mean, that's a really good, good example of, of singing from the, what I call the Appalachian vernacular. So it's kind of like you're just up there in the hills, you know, you're just singing like you're doing. And so, you're, so you kind of <laughs> develop this kind of Southern, references or whatever if you follow me is that the start of the process of using lots of different voices exploring all the different facets of voice yeah and, you know if you compare that vocal for example to or or you know when she breathes i do the same thing the same kind of referencing southern singing so so uh I think if you compare that to the very first, well, actually the first thing was the blood curdling scream on, uh, I think it's Time is Money. Uh, but, but I think that if you, if you hear the first uh, layers of background vocals I did, they were choral and I did multiple harmonies. So those are the very first serious, you know, swans vocals to me. And, and those are almost operatic. I mean, they <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that uh, he used that kind of choral, uh, go up a fourth, go up a fourth. You know what I mean? And then another example, Children of God, um, the song Children of God, which is also the, the, the main melody there, the keyboard part. I play a melody on that sample that I created. It's not just playing itself. At any rate, I have the music, music credit for that at least, writing that. But, but um, that is like, in my mind, that's the Hare Krishna girl. So that's why those, those harmonies of we are children, children of God, like that's our suffering bodies will suffer no more. That's, that's like I'm kind of imagining myself, you know, at the mall, you know, like with, with a little, you know, you know what I mean, like a cult, cult girl. So, that, so that's another idea of, of, of way of in my garden, the lead vocal is visualizing myself as a flute and being so breathy that I was like right on the mic and I had to increase mm -hmm. the gain. And someone stepped above on the floorboards and the creek was picked up. So in those days, you did it again, you know. So, so that was like nearly killed me from lack of oxygen. <laughs> it right in me. It's a really hard vocal to do. <laughs> so you yeah, saying we helped each other. We definitely helped each other with, with singing and, and how to pronounce things. And then, for example, when I did, um, I don't know if it was the first version of Black Male on the B-side. Uh, that's an example where he wanted to be me to be more and more, I guess, alluring, you know, more provocative, more seductive. And then uh, when I did um, my version of Love Will Tear Us Apart, um, that was like, you know, Patsy, Patsy Klein, like more soulful. Now, to me, I was, I was, I was, you know, channeling and I was, you know, feeling, you know, death. I was feeling, you know, Killing oneself, I was feeling pain, and but he was saying, you know, you're you're channeling Patsy Cline. So I did the second verse. He was like, your half second verse is flawless. Go back and be that mournful in that first verse. So see, there was, there was like a director in a movie directing an actress. You know, would be the way he was as a producer for me when I was singing, and it, it was the same way. The same way when I would give him my opinion about his vocal deliveries. Mm -hmm. Mm. So, I mean, Burning World, Laswell repeatedly asked me to, to make the call on was that a take or not. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it, we work both ways in the studio. and We both knew what each other could do. Now, the last time I performed live with them was actually in Atlanta when they, when they came through. And I, he asked me to get up and sing uh, Blood on Your Hands. And so um, and when it was done, he was upset because he could, he said the the vocal was uh, he could tell that the monitors were wrong. And of course, the monitors were horrible. And of mm -hmm. course, they changed from the sound check to live. Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so and I, and I said, how did you know? You know, because oh yeah, you noticed that. You know, he goes, he says, yeah, of course I noticed it. You know, so see that that kind of brought back 
the warm fuzzies, you know, because I was like, oh, no, I remember those those days. And we both would share what that experience was like because we were both doing singing live. So it's like, you know what I mean? So there are positive connective points for me anyway. I'm just going to speak for myself. I mean, you were saying a minute ago about, you know, this felt this, you know, the royalty section, this is, it was going to be a permanent situation that this project was going to go on forever. But of course, like everything, it, it doesn't, and there's an end point. And so, so what happened in the end? And what, what would you, and, and after that bit afterwards, were you just completely exhausted or? I know. I was happy because 95 and 97, we're, we were seeing the biggest audiences and we were playing the best venues. The venues were getting better and better. I don't know about London, but they were getting better and better elsewhere uh, to play the botanical gardens and, and Brussels was was amazing. And I was couldn't have been more excited to play there. And I think that uh, to me, I just saw the audiences increasing in size, um, the audiences getting more and more enthusiastic. I thought the 97 uh, music, the way that that set flowed, was wildly uh, exciting and, and, and positive. I mean, I just heard the screaming. And, the, you know, and I'll never forget that after-show party. I could write a whole story, a whole like ep- article about the after-show party because it was not only after-show party uh, at, at the Columbia Hotel near Hyde Park, across from Hyde mm-hmm. Park. It was not only the after-show party, it was the after tour after swan's party so it was a heavy you know what i mean like Mm. triple and um i think that uh what i remember was uh well i shouldn't keep on with that but anyway there was mm, too much and i think (laughs) 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 i think i think that uh not for me uh but that was interesting because fans had been following us around crashed found out where it was and crashed and I had to eventually leave and go up, get out of there because I was running around, running. I mean, it was just, I didn't, you know, it was no, I mean, now on, I was like going crazy with these kids. And so, so finally the roadie, uh, the roadie took care of it. <laughs> the roadie <laughs> took care of it. And all I, all I heard was the sound of fists. And I, and I just climbed the stairs and went to bed. I was like, I'm out of here. I'm on a plane in the but yeah, but 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 um, it, 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 I just saw it as being getting better and better, you know, in terms of the actual music. But the dynamic, no, the the the, the screaming and the, yeah, and, and and then the tension. That what was going on was, I guess, the stress of it being the last tour was um, changing the set every single night, mm-hmm. every single night. So it's like do this this many times. Now do this this many times and change. And I had notes on the keyboard. I didn't know where I was. And then there was came a show where the drummer, drummer par excellence, like this guy's amazing, you know, Phil Puglia, he messed up. He didn't know what was going on because every single rehearsal, and we're exhausted. We have sleep deprivation, massive sleep deprivation. So we can't just get into the zone and play. We have to remember what's different about this night compared to last night. And so there was that kind of tension with this constant changing of the way the set is and how many times you're going to do something before you change and, 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 and then learning of new material. So that created a lot of stress and tension and, and, and dynamic with the members. And it got really bad. It got really, really bad. And, and then the, uh, the tour managers... <sighs> Uh, unable to hold down the fort. It just got worse and worse and worse with the tension. And so I think that, you know, analyzing it now, um, Michael's father had just literally just died before the tour started. And then, and then um, you know, the, the pressure of it being the last tour, the, the sense of grief and, and, and pain. Um, and again, I had nothing to do with it. I was informed of it. And I was angry because I was informed instead of no one cared what I thought. It was just done. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I was had a resentment. I was angry as hell, actually. I didn't sign autographs. I didn't, I wanted, I was so. And, and I think that, um, you know, this, this changing the set every, 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 uh, every sound check mm-hmm. got to be where the point where it was just too much. Um, this happened before we went to Europe, and then it culminated in L.A. When we finished the U.S. tour. Get, hadn't done Europe yet. Hadn't gone over there yet. So 
that's when there was the screaming and yelling and all this. And then um, we, we hit the dressing room, uh, the Roxy, and um, the audience was going ballistic. They were screaming for encore. They were stomping their feet. So we were in the dressing room, and Michael was running, you know, sliding into the dressing room, just at the top of his lungs, saying, You're worse than bad. You're the most mediocre lineup of swans there has ever been. And you have shamed me in my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> so then left. So we're like, maybe the audience is like. <laughs> so we're just like, and I'm like, oh, my God. So then Dan Gerard's brother comes in there. He's in the hallway. He's heard it. He's just like. Yep, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> so, so then um, I mentioned it before who it was. I probably shouldn't. I don't know. But anyway, a member said, um, so what do we do, Jarbo? I'm ready to go home now. I'm ready to get on a plane and go home now. And I said, so-and-so, this sounds so like soldier-esque. Maybe it was. I don't know. <laughs> it's just honest. It's just, you know, so-and-so, no, we – this is not about you. This is not about me. It's not about the emotions. It's not about any of that. It's about the name. And so for the name, the legacy of it, the legacy of the name, we have to keep on going. And we just have to. That's just the way it is. We're finishing this. We're going over Europe, and we're finishing that. And that's just it. And I gave them, I gave them the pep talk. And so we <laughs> kept it going, kept it together. I never got a thank you for that. So the point was is that when you know we kept him going, but it just got worse. It just the tension just got worse. And and the, I think it was just a lot of criticism. I mean, had so many times I can mention so many incidents. For, uh, for you know, for example, um, t- on stage in front of the audience, you know, humiliating one of the people by getting in front of them and <laughs> play like this. <laughs> You know, in front of the audience. So it's like there's a certain certain amount of my, mom, my father used to say, "Don't back a man up against the wall." So I think that oh, that's uh, no one's going to understand what that means in this day and age. <laughs> Let's just say a person, yeah. a person up against the wall. What it means is that's what he said. I thought. What it means is you, you maintain a certain amount of dignity, and if you're the boss, you're not going to um, degrade them or humiliate them in front of the other employees. You take them mm-hmm. privately into the room, and you discuss what can happen. Well, so that didn't happen. So that would happen in front of the audience. So that, of course, would just create more tension. And just a lot of screaming and yelling, you know, not, not just with me, but with the various people, mm-hmm. the various members. And um, people quitting, and, you know, and then and walking on stage, you know, and, and doing it. And then, um, and then I remember one show where we couldn't even get into the dressing room because he and another artist, a number of the group, was screaming, and we were locked out. So you, you know, you're sweaty. You just want to get something to drink and you know, change your clothes or something, and you can't get in there. So, so that went, you know, so things like that would happen. So I wouldn't say. I think it had to do with a, a combination of. Factors. Now, there was also someone else involved who was a business person in those days, and they told him that the name had a negative connotation to it and that he should kill the name and come up with something new. Um, and I disagree with that. I think the name um, had, a, a, well, I think I've been proven right. Mm-hmm. I think the name had a positive excitement about it. So, yeah, sure, there was uh, places where we were banned and all this, but that changed. I mean, you know, in the early days, there were sound bear, sound limiters or something, volume limiters, and we would have to have to have the show stopped and be moved to another venue. And you know, we had this massive uh, uh, PA requirement on the rider, and when that was fulfilled, it was play in these towns where the cops would show up. It was considered too loud, and, and you know, we were banned in a city in Switzerland, you know, because we were too loud, and the <laughs> cop come, they, they were on stage breaking up the show, and I mean, you know, so, so I mean, sure, we had a bad reputation, but so what? I mean, it's like, it's like that's, that's, that's publicity. <laughs> That's a list. So, so I think that I disagree with the idea that the name had a, um, hmm. a negative connotation. So then another name was tried in a project without me, and I don't think that was quite as 
Angels of Light. I don't think that was nearly as successful. And then I think that um, then you waited and brought it back. And so to me, there's just been tremendous amounts of excitement with the children of the college age children of the original audiences are showing up. Mm -hmm. And I think I that, I think that that's, you know, cause I've been to two of the shows only two. First one was very painful. Second one was better cause I had a cameo of singing, but the first one was basically like, you know, knife in the chest and, uh, you know, hard cried, you know, tried you to not cry. I was in the audience. We so, disappointed so, not disappointed not to be part of the. Um, well, no, I understood what, was, what what made me start crying was I understood exactly what was going on musically, and I, I felt like it was my you know home, like it was something I understood. So it made you feel weird to not be there because you knew everybody up there, you know, and you felt like yeah, yes. this is weird. It was just weird. But I, um, I know you're on the I, I, I know. I looked. Yeah. I, I will say my point was I looked around. And I saw that they were kids. So the thing was, is that I think that they are the age of, of the children of the people that probably had the records, if it makes sense. When you, if you hear a swan, a, a modern swan's track, can you hear your parts in it? <laughs> well, except for the seer, which he asked me to do a couple of little vocal things on, some background mm -hmm. vocals, and then like a collage thing. Um, I haven't heard it. Mm. Is it too painful? To it. Yeah. Uh, I just can't. I can't mm. listen to it. I just, I can't, you know, I just can't. That's so, understandable. Yeah. Um, I just can't. I, 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 I know that um, I've heard it live twice, and I know one of the people that was in, maybe still is involved, with it, I don't know, was involved, in, uh, has said that they described it as um, Wagnerian, well, I mean, you could say that it was sort of Wagnerian in terms of long musical passages that rise and fall. And rise. You could say that it had Wagnerian aspects to it uh, for uh, an era, one of the eras I was involved in too. So I think that I think that um, the idea of very very long passages, long long things that rise and fall, that are more uh, heavily orchestrated or whatever. That's something I completely understand, and you know, people have people have uh, commented to me that that's what it's like. So I think that um, that's enough. I don't need to. I mean, there's. I'm sorry. There's just no. I don't have any interest in hearing hearing something I'm not involved in. And anyway, that sounds that's, terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> no, no, not really. No, it's it's completely understandable. I don't, yeah, it sounds terrible. <laughs> Go ahead. But, but anyway, I'm bored of swans. <laughs> Talk about swans. Um, because in the last uh, 23 years, you've been doing loads of records, mm -hmm. loads of music, mm -hmm. um, incredibly diverse. And you, you seem to be never in one place at once, which is interesting. It's, it's almost like maybe experience being swans has made you react to making music in a completely different way, would you say? Or is this, is this, just, an apt, is this just the way you, you've always liked to make music, you know, and... There's a lot of collaborations and... Well, you can't possibly uh, go through that many years um, uh, without it being a kind of a university or education. So you take that education with you. I mean, I think that I would say, did you go to, what school did you go to? I would say, well, the school's called Swan. So, I mean, I think that, I think that uh, that was my first, what you call professional project in terms of labels and and that kind of thing. So I think that it, it's an education that you you don't ever lose that. You don't lose that education. Um, but I mean, I'm going to bring work from my world, you know, with what I do and, and, and those worlds. That they, I, I do, I definitely do concept albums. And even though the concept may not be um, something that everyone could pick up on, uh, I think there's a certain amount of people that do pick up on it. And, and that's gratifying. But, I mean, it's like a world. You're entering a world. And um, I would say what drives me now is uh, mysticism, uh, you know, the supernatural. And, and um, uh, I'm kind of returning now to, <clears throat> to uh, embracing emotional things that I turned away from for a while. Like for a while, I was definitely focusing on political and environmental uh, uh, upheaval, like a Hawk Holly album, which is about environmental upheaval. And I think that, 
you know, a song that I got Philip Anselmo to sing on um, Overthrown. It's, you know, it's about environmental upheaval and devastation. So in my mind, it was using the Mahakali figure, the creation and destruction of the environment. And then I've done political songs. I did one called The Rally, where I took a, a subversive recording of the Donald Trump rally, and I flipped it, and I turned it into what sounds like a, a rally from another town and another place. And that's a chilling, horrible thing to hear. And so I think that, and then I did Man of Hate for the second time on the last um, label album, Man of Hate on, is on Illusory. And I did it very plaintively with the, no vocal effects and just kind of very plaintively from the heart. To, to, to drive home the lyrics that say, you can't blame, we're responsible for this, you know? Don't look at, don't look at others. You, we have, we, you know, we collectively, the people, have enabled this to occur. Mm-hmm. And so, so I think that there's a certain amount of culpability in, 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 in things that happen, uh, happen politically. And, and, and so, so that's something I've, um, uh, I've addressed repeatedly, things that are not from the heart. So now I think the last, this last thing I've worked on, I mean, I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm referencing, um, it was kind of thinking about the pandemic and referencing the idea of being close to a person in, in confinement and, and, and unable to open yourself to the world. So the world is, is, um, you know, it is not here to us now, and it's just us. Uh, so hold me through this, and so that's see, that's a very uh, romantic kind of a thing to be writing about. <laughs> I think that I think that I felt like that that needed to say that. I needed to say that now. You, uh, what's interesting is you work a lot. Of people have um, very very distinctive sounds, quite strong will. People like neurosis. You know, they definitely have a vision. Uh, Justin Broderick, who's definitely got a vision of what, what, what he likes doing. But you, it meets in the middle. That you s- maybe similar in a way that you worked with Michael years ago, that you, you draw something out of them which they didn't know they had, and it's kind of, and they draw something out of you as well. A proper collaboration yeah. in a sense. I don't know. When you said Justin, it makes me smile because we did the Necromonicon together in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, summer before last. And it was Godflesh, and and it was just it was so great. We were in the dressing room, and they had there to run up and get on, up on stage, and and we just had these big smiles on our faces, and we to hug each other. It just made me feel really cool, you know, because that that like that of all places, you know, the HP Lovecraft Festival. It's a convention for HP Lovecraft uh, uh, fans, a writers' convention, and so they have music, you know, edited too, and they chose me and. And uh, Godflesh, so that was that was just so cool. I love him, so, and it was just it was just a moment of joy, you know. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I, I guess, I guess, I mean, I think, I think the discipline was was good. Uh, the thing with working with the because they're very disciplined. There's no improv. It's just like boom, boom, back right to the second. So that mm-hmm. was cool because that was a, a new thing for me to uh live with the group was literally like there's a song called with them there's a song where i I literally i'm panting it's a very nasty kind of a lyric it's a song called within so so there's this panting which is well almost referencing like a dog in heat or something right so it's kind of like so it's just kind of like this constant (sighs) so 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 you so i did that thing i had to literally count (laughs) <laughs> how many times I was doing that and then trying not to get faint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I did it, you know, it was live. And then you have to immediately go right into a vocal. And you're like trying not to get dizzy. <laughs> so I mean, but so that was really cool. So so they so they allowed me, they allowed me, you know, these eccentricities, of course. But again, I had to fit into their dynamic, which is it's precisely the same every single night. Mm-hmm. Hmm. There's was no chance ch- for mistakes. If is you that a challenge? Mess- yeah. huh? Is that a yeah. challenge? Yes, it's, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a challenge because I'm not used to. I'm not. I'm used to kind of like working in positions that, you know, I may f- be feeling the room, and I may want to say this longer. So just kind of be aware of that. Hmm. You may want to do this because the room might be into. I might really be feeling this, you know, and I might be channeling the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had that kind of self-indulgent, you know, where you're feeling the situation live. So within it was just like, you know, having to count, like, 
okay, five, six, <laughs> doing it. And I did, I think I did it for two minutes or something. I mean, it was just hardcore. Mm. So see, I fit into their, their mathematical approach to, to how they perform. Very disciplined. <laughs> So with, with a lot of these projects, you do you initially get a concept of a sound that you're looking for and, and look for a band that, you know, somebody's in that area that you could work with? Or, or is it completely random? Somebody might say, do you want to work with this band? The band may ask you. You may ask the band. It's... I think that really, I mean, I think it's like we know each other first. You know what I mean? We know mm-hmm. each other, and so so um, you just discuss how cool it would be to work together. So that's generally how it happens. I would say, in the case of Joseph von Lysum, um, I, he um, he, I, I was asked for I'm trying to remember if it was the Wire. There was some, two magazines. They asked me to make a list of music or something that I loved, and it's hard because I didn't want one to be more important than the other. So it wasn't like a list. Like this is number mm-hmm. one. Um, but um, uh, I, I mentioned uh, uh, the Only Lovers Left Alive soundtrack and, and how much I loved it and played it all the time. So I think that, uh, that he, so he somehow saw that or whatever. So then he um, wrote me and, and contacted me and asked me to sing with him on his last, his last album on, on one of the songs. And so that, of course, you know, was like I, do, I don't, haven't met him in person, but but we know the same people and also um, I'm very aware of his work. And then he knew people that knew me to give me uh, references, right? So you got to have some kind of, I think, reference point of, of who you work with because otherwise you're just going in cold and you don't know what that's going to be like. So, I mean, generally it's, it's someone you know or someone you have some kind of friends of friends or connection through connection kind of thing is how it happens. I mean, Neurosis and I talked for, for a long time about working together. You know, and they were just always on the road. I mean, they were never not on the road. And so finally when they got off the road is when, the, when it happened. Mm-hmm. Which uh, I guess brings us to the end of this interview. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, well, no, I enjoy talking to you. I'm just worried about my battery, but it's, we're hanging in there. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. It's really, really fascinating. Yeah, thanks for your time. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, John. It was great, yeah. great meeting you and talking to you. Yeah, okay. And when, when this all right. over and you, you finally get on tour, uh, probably see I you here in Manchester. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love it. I'd love touring. Okay. All righty. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, all right. thanks a lot then. All right. Job. Okay. Bye. See you. Bye. Okay. Bye.